interim dean of the College of Information Sciences and Technology, and it's my very great pleasure to welcome you to this final set of speakers, which is the conclusion of what's been a truly amazing um, startup week for the College of IST. This is really our capstone event. We call it the Silicon Valley speaker finale. Um, but before I introduce our first speaker, I wanted to take just a minute to, to think back over the week and how amazing it's been with all the student competitions and pitches. We had the startup tank this morning on Tuesday. We had demos and speakers over here at the hub in our innovation expo. We've had lots of just amazing visitors who've come and given very inspiring talks, met with students. We had a great event last night where we got to get together informally and exchange ideas, and I saw lots of connections being made. And so I, one thing to think back is all the connections that have been made during this week. It's really amazing. Um, so I think that you, if you think about all that, you will see how much the energy and passion and all the attention towards innovation has really inspired everybody from, you know, people who actually work at this for their life to students who have dreams of doing this in the future. Um, and I'd also like to uh, thank President Barron, who, as some of you know, has helped to uh, support this event in various ways, including coming to our event last night to announce the winners and the prizes of our various competitions. So, you know, he his support has been very important and we hope that that will continue in the future. And of course, what we've done is very much akin to some of his themes these days. So we're really, really <laughs> excited to be a part of that and I hope we will uh, continue on further. Um, now, before I introduce our first speaker, her uh, liaison, Becky, Becca? Becca. Is going to give the rules of the house. Hi, everyone. Um, just a couple housekeeping things. Um, we ask that you please silence your cell phones, give your full attention to Adora. Um, in terms of questions, we will be taking them at the end through a couple different methods. First is through Poll Everywhere. What you can do is you can text IST Startup, one word, and then a space in your question to 22333. Again, text IST Startup, one word, a space, and then your question to 22333. Um, you could also use Twitter, just hashtag IST Startup, one word again, and then just good old fashioned hand raising. Thank you. Got it? Okay. All right, now with great pleasure, I will introduce our first speaker, Adora Chen. She's the CEO and co-founder of HomeJoy, and she's on the board of the HomeJoy Foundation. Before that, she worked as a lead product manager at Slide. She left the job to start up a company with her brother, um, a company named PathJoy, which is a startup that connects life coaches to clients online. In 2012, Adora and her brother founded HomeJoy, and they've watched it grow from a team of two to a team of over 120 employees and a platform that serves hundreds of thousands of households across the US, Canada, the United Kingdom, and Germany. Uh, Ms. Chen holds a master's degree in economics from the University of Rochester and a bachelor's degree in computer science from Clemson University. Please join me in welcoming Adora. Hello, how's everyone doing today? Awesome. Um, so I'm going to chat with you guys for 15 minutes, but I want to mostly take questions because I think that's usually most instructive. Um, but I was asked to talk about um, how to come up with ideas or how to be inspired and get ideas to create your startup. And so maybe let me go quickly about HomeJoy and then how, to, how HomeJoy got started and how we came up with the idea. It was very long crazy process, um, but, and then we can get into questions. So um, HomeJoy, if you guys don't know, we are the get help button for every home. So what that means is we are the easiest, most convenient uh, way to connect with home service professionals 
And so if you want a cleaner or a handyman or a carpet cleaner, you just come to our site, tell us a little bit about what you want, and then we send someone that's very well qualified to your door at the date and time you want them. Um, so it's a quick one, two minute process, um, and, and, um, and then you're on your way. So um, what's, we could talk about HomeJoy all day long, and I would love to do that, but I think you know, for the purpose of this today, um, I wanted to talk more about how HomeJoy got started uh, because I think it's instructive in uh, things not to do, um, uh, and then you can back out what you should probably be doing. Um, so the overall theme of what I wanted to talk about is that you know, a, there are many ideas out there, and execution definitely matters, um, but the idea that you come up with should be essentially you know, a, a problem that you understand. And to really understand a problem, you must really feel the problem so that you know when you build your product or you build your service, that feeling goes away. Um, and so I will come back to that theme um, once every so often today. So HomeJoy, you know, HomeJoy has been around for two and a half, three years now. But in actuality, the actual corporate entity of the company started in 2009. So um, as mentioned before, my co-founder is my younger brother, Aaron. In 2009, he graduated uh, from MIT and moved to Silicon Valley and was just crashing at uh, my place. And he, he was just working on his own startup and that failed. And he was just you know, lying around and I had just quit my job and we decided to work together. And our mission at that point was, hey, let's build something that makes people happy, which is super generic. You can do many things to fulfill that kind of mission, um, but we just knew that's what we wanted to do. And so the first thing that we did was we thought, okay, the first idea we literally came up with, which was just mentioned, was a thing called Pathjoy, which was who makes people happy? Um, and we thought, okay, it must be life coaches and therapists. They're, you know, all these, all these people are sad and you know, they go to these people and they you know, must be happier you know, when they come out the end. And so we decided to uh, build a platform. And the platform was essentially a video software that we built, which at that point in 2009, there was no API for it. So it was actually kind of hard. And um, we set the service up. It took us a couple of months to build it. And we tried to get, we got a bunch of therapists and life coaches on there. Um, and then nobody came. Two weeks in, three weeks in, four weeks in, um, and it was just looking like a disaster. Um, and so Aaron and I sat around and said, "Okay, well, we should just use our own product and see, you know, why aren't people actually using it?" And when we went through the whole process and we went through trying to use the video software, which kind of worked, um, but we got life coaches and therapists, and we're not cynical people by any nature, but we just thought it was the dumbest thing ever. Um, it was just not a service that seemed useful to us and um, we weren't very passionate about. So the first lesson we learned in the whole journey of working on a startup is that you should really be working on a problem that, that you know, speaks to you and you can be passionate over because otherwise you know, it, you know, when things don't go well, you're just going to quit, which is exactly what we did. We just decided to pivot and move on to another idea. Um, and so, like I said, lesson number one, um, problem, there must be a problem, and the problem you must, um, you must be very in tuned and um, be, uh, be aware of. So the second thing we did was we sat around, and I was, um, we were just learning how to code together, and we were trying to just do cool tech, tech projects. And so at that time, um, real-time um, real APIs and real-time stuff was becoming very popular. And so, how many, are there any engineers in this crowd? Oh, cool, okay, sweet. Um, and so, basically, we tried to create a framework around that. Um, and then, I spent two or three months on it, just literally creating this, this stuff. And then, I turned to my brother, who had actually been working on something else different, and I said, hey, look at this cool thing. And he said, hey, what are we gonna do with it? And I said, hey, let's just put, Q&A software or a Q&A platform on it. Um, there was a there was something called Quora at that time. Which anybody know what Quora is? Okay, okay. so Quora is like this popular thing in Silicon Valley um, where you know they uh, lots of great content on it, um, and they built real time software um, to allow for quick interactions and communications. Um, and I said, oh hey, let's just build Quora, and then we're going to make people pay for it. Um, 
And so you can imagine where that went, not very far. Um, there's already free version out there, why would anyone pay for it? Um, and so that's an example of you know, starting to build something with no purpose whatsoever and just a problem that didn't exist at all. Um, and um, yeah, there was a cool engineering project, but at the end of the day, we were setting up to build a business, and so uh, that just you know, went nowhere. Um, anyway, so we, we ended up pivoting actually a dozen times and I also, I get, I get a lot of questions on, you know, when do you know this idea is dead and, and move on? Um, and I don't think there's any, I don't think there's any uh, straight answer to that other than, you know, you need to, when you get an idea, you need to be executing very, very hard on it. And you know it's dead when um, no one's coming to it, but you need to create a growth plan. And so a growth plan is something like, you know, on week one, you should get at least one user. That should be really, uh, with a new product that anyone would use, you should be able to get at least one user. In week two, you get two users. Week three, you get four users, and you kind of see exponentially it can grow over time. And you should be able to hit those targets and do whatever it takes to get through that week to make that, to make those progress. And after a while of three, three or four weeks in a row and you're not making those targets, then you probably know it's, you gotta completely switch up, you know, how you're building or trying to solve the problem or you just kind of you know, continue, um, or you just pivot and move on to the next idea. So um, back to Homejoy itself. In 2012, after doing, like I said, a dozen ideas, and you know, that period, what we, I like call it the dark ages, because nothing happened. We just um, were living on very little savings, and we're like in credit card debt. And I was sitting in Aaron's apartment, um, and he's like a typical bachelor, maybe, I mean, he was just out of college, so close to where you guys are, and he never cleaned his place, and his bathroom was nasty, um, to the point where I would literally walk three, four blocks down the street to go to a bakery and like buy a coffee so I can use their restroom, and he and I would just complain all the time, like, "We have to work in your place. Can you please keep it clean? You know, you know that feeling when it's clean, you are productive, and." Um, Finally, he just got annoyed one day and said, okay, I'm just going to find a cleaner. And so he went to that process. He thought it would just take him five minutes and then get rid of all my complaints. Um, but what happened was when he went to go search for a cleaner, it was, it was a long and arduous process that he didn't expect. And so what he ran into was, you know, to find a trusted cleaner, a reliable trusted cleaner that you felt comfortable coming to your home, you would have to pay, you know, these agencies and referral agencies a lot of money, which we didn't have at the time. Or you could go on Craigslist and find someone, but you know, there's so many ax murder stories out there, like you wouldn't want, you know, who, why would you want to trust someone to come there? And so he came back to me and said, hey, I actually think there's a problem here. It's actually really hard for me to find a cleaner, but I know that there's hundreds of thousands of people who are cleaners, so what's the problem? And so when you look deeper into it, and in general, when you take it up a level to home service professionals, what you find is that it's a very inefficient, highly fragmented marketplace. And so there's a lot of individual cleaners out there, but it, they're very hard to find. They're very hard to discover. And on top of that, if you can get in touch with one, it's very hard to schedule um, because they're probably really good and that's why you got in touch with them. So scheduling is a nightmare. And on top of that, there's really a, no price transparency. You know, you don't know how much you're gonna pay until they actually show up. Um, and on top of that, the quality service is never guaranteed. And so there's just a host of problems that he discovered by just looking into this one problem where, you know, it was set off by just me complaining. And so here it's a problem that, you know, like I said, and coming back to the original theme, the, uh, it was a problem that he really felt, which was Adora, me complaining to him all the time. And he knew how to get rid of that feeling, which was me stopping by, you know, finding a cleaner. And so, um, so we started, so he came to me and said, hey, let's look at this. And um, so we looked at it and it turns out cleaning industry is an extremely large market. Like I th when we started this, I thought, you know, it was going to be, you know, a lifestyle type business. You know, you could make a few thousand dollars and that was it. But it turns out that it's not. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. Um, and if you are able to aggregate all the, um, all the folks into one platform, um, it can be uh, pretty, pretty profitable. So what the problem was, okay, we decided let's put a booking flow up online and let's see if customers come and try to just book a house cleaning. 
So we did that. We did it over the weekend. It was very quick, and nobody came. So this felt like four, three years ago with Path Joy, with the life coaches thing. Like, just no one wants to use this product. Um, but then what we decided was, okay, we need to we need to actually validate that this that this idea is good or not. And so we went and hustled, and we went to street fairs, and we guilt tripped people into booking cleanings there. Um, and so then. Eventually, we got one, two, like I said, we had a growth plan. We got one, one week, two the next week, four the next week, so on and so forth. Um, so we started seeing demand, which was great. Uh, but ultimately, you know, the real test of whether you have a good idea is they book the cleaning, they get the cleaning, and then you do the cleaning well, and then they come back and book another one. So kind of the idea of activity and repeat usage is very, very important. Um, so... To quickly go over on the other side, you know, we got all these cleanings booked, and then we try, and then our other customer is actually cleaners themselves, um, cleaning professionals themselves, and um, we contacted, you know, a dozen or so, and all of them said, I don't want to work on the platform. And so we had all these cleanings, and what would, what, we just sat there and said, oh, no, that's, you know, what are we going to do? Um, so we decided actually to go clean ourselves, um, and we went, and this was in Mountain View, California, which is like 30 miles south of San Francisco. So we show up to the house, and I remember the first house I went up to, it was this guy named Joe, and he had um, basically said, I have a post-construction cleanup, at, um, which I learned this is not what um, we should have been doing. But we showed up, it was a 9,000 square foot house in Los Saltos Hills, and um, it was clean, actually. It looked clean, um, but the problem was they were just finishing up construction, and so there was a lot of dust everywhere. And so we sat there for literally three days straight cleaning with paper towels and slippers and stuff like that, which I come to learn, actually, there's a machine that you can do it in, like, an hour. You can just go around doing this. Um, but we didn't know what, what we were doing. But the point is, is that, you know, we, we have a two-sided marketplace problem, and we need two sets of consumers. We need to drive value from not just... One, um, not just the clients itself, but the cleaners itself. And so we learned a lot. One, we were really shitty cleaners, but two, uh, that, um, that this was hard work. And so um, long story short, we set out to um, go find and validate this idea for the cleaner side. And what we found was for the cleaners, you know, they're, indiv they're usually individual sole proprietors, and they aren't able to scale up their operations very fast because they don't have the systems and tools to do so. And same with cleaning companies. They're usually very much mom and pop, small mom and pop companies or small franchises. And they're often only have 12 or 13 cleaning professionals in the business um, because they don't know how to get further than that. Um, it's things like, you know, trying to schedule 12 to 13 cleaners all at once for the next day. These, this is actually a very hard problem. Software can solve it in under a second. Um, but if you're just doing it manually, it requires, you know, a lot of smarts and, all, you know, sometimes a couple people. So, um, and on top of that, you know, the traditional offline buying behaviors of, um, is, is uh, for products, you know, in the 90s, that Amazon solved it. So people started trusting um, for products. You can uh, click a button online and it'll actually show up to your doorstep. And then these days, people are trusting services as well. So Uber, obviously, is the big example in HomeJoy for home services. And so the, for the individual cleaning professionals who were hustling on the street in the offline world, they still do that today, it was clear that the value proposition to them was, I need to be on the online world, and HomeJoy platform was the way to do it, because that's the only way I can get clients now and in the future, or a lot of clients now in the future. Um, and so we set out on essentially a roadshow of talking to tons of individual uh, service professionals or cleaning professionals, and one by one, after f like four, like the first cleaner we brought on the platform, I still remember to this day, her name is Stacy, and I sat in a San Jose coffee shop with her for many hours, um, convincing her that this was great, and, um, and she finally signed on. And it's, it's always getting to that first person, um, and then everything, you build confidence and everything starts rolling from there. Um, so, all this is to say, you know, to even validate the idea, um, it takes, a like, that was a one-month process. It takes a really long time, and you just have to, s you have to get, you have to do two things. One is you have to get out of your seat and actually talk to people and get feedback. Um, a lot of people, you know, there's a lot of articles out there about metrics and 
tracking things and being extremely quantitative. But in the early, early days, when you're trying to validate something, you don't, that doesn't matter. What you need is qualitative feedback. You need, you know, you need your gut and make gut checks. Um, and until it starts growing, until you have, you know, thousands of users, like metrics don't really matter. Um, it's about building a great product that people will keep using over and over and over again. Um, and um, I lost my train of thought. Yeah, so I, I think, I think like coming back to the, to my original theme, which is, you know, again, have a problem, really understand it, and um, really be a problem you can be passionate about. Um, so I think a lot of, while you're in college, there's, is everyone in college? Is everyone a student here? Is that, oh, okay, cool. Um, so, you know, one of the things I wished I did in hindsight when I was in college is I wished I had spent more time coding and working on projects and just tinkering with things and just exploring things. I don't think you can build a startup and by searching for an idea, like deeply searching for an idea and just sitting around and, you know, thinking of things. Um, I think it's you just need to experience life and you need to have the problem come to you. Um, and that's when the best ideas occur um, versus, um, like I said, searching for it. Um, with that, I think um, if there are any questions I can answer, I'm happy to take questions. Questions? Questions from the audience? Anybody? Yeah. Hold on, let me get you the mic so that they can hear you. Uh, do you have any advice on how you would maybe stay motivated after facing rejection? Because obviously you guys have pivoted multiple times. So, I mean, a lot of people will get down after a couple of times of getting uh, rejected. Do you have any suggestions on how to stay motivated? Yeah. Um, co-founder must, my co-founder is my younger brother, which could be like, could be a disaster um, or it could work out great like it has. Um, I do have two other siblings who I absolutely can't work with. Um, but. So having the right co-founder is to, you know, when you're down for them to cheer you up, like is very important to have that cadence. Um, beyond that, you know, the way we pushed through was essentially saying, there, it's execution that matters and the idea, if like if we just kept executing an idea after idea after idea, we, we would eventually come to, like we would just randomly come to an idea that would work. Um, and so we just kind of stuck with that train of thought, um, you know. Hard work is the easy part, <laughs> actually. It's like just randomly falling into an idea that actually works, that's the hard part. Um, and after some point, we also created a cadence. Like I said, if you have a growth plan, then you know like when the, you know, you feel pretty confident when the time is to move on to the next idea. And every time you start a new idea, it's really, uh, it's really, it's like the best time ever because you can think of so many possibilities of how to go about doing it and solving it, and um, so it's actually quite fun to start over um, uh, before getting into the nitty gritty of things. So uh, with Pastoral and Homejoy, you were in a situation where you had to get uh, basically experienced professionals on board maybe before you're bringing in revenue so like with a cleaning person or the therapist what type of negotiations were you able you know to go through with them so that they would come on despite not getting paid first yeah that's a good question um so what i found is you have to have a very clear vision of what you are building and on top of that you just step in their shoes and think of what do i want so for life coaches and therapists they um they have they like to talk a lot. Um, well, life coaches like to talk a lot. Therapists just like to listen a lot. Um, and and so they they want. I mean, ultimately they want clients. That's that's what it is. And so yeah, you can just say, hey, I'm going to get you a bunch of clients. But how do they actually trust that you're going to pay them and stuff like that? And so the first first person we brought into the HomeJoy platform was um, was someone we just actually paid more than we would otherwise, and said, okay, for being the first one and trying this out. We're gonna, and you're gonna have you know, feedback every single day with you. We're gonna talk with you a lot. We're gonna be partners in this whole thing. Um, and, and so at the end of the day, people just want feedback and they want to be heard and they want to be loved. Um, and so that's, um, that's what you want to provide for them. 
for the life coaches and therapists, it was almost the exact same thing. That platform, we didn't pay anybody. Um, there was no transaction per se. It was just connecting people. Um, and we convinced them through the idea of, same idea, which was um, we're talking to you every day. We want to help you grow your business. Um, here's how we're thinking. Um, and usually if they're, especially if they're coming from a non-tech world, the whole tech stuff is actually very intriguing to them. And um, they're willing to, you know, if they're willing to actually jump into it, then they're willing to, you know, go the distance with you. Um, but just making sure that you're talking to them every single day is very, very important um, so that they know that, um, you know, they've got, you've got your, they've, you've got their back. Does that answer your question? So you mentioned um, how working with family could be either like a great idea or a bad idea. Mm -hmm. Do you have any s like specific experiences or examples of how working with your brother has strictly impacted your business as opposed to working with someone that you're not related to? Yes. So I've worked with uh, I've worked with friends and I've worked with uh, Aaron, um, my brother. Um, I think the you know, when, when it comes down to really tough times, like, family will never leave. Um, and if we ever got into, we rarely got into arguments, actually. We're pretty chill people. Um, and so arguments are really lame. It's just like us, you know, like, ah, no, okay, okay, and then it gets solved. Um, but at the end of the day, like, we have, there's also the higher power of mom there. So at the end of the day, you know, we can't, there's, um, there is a, there is a stopping point. Um. I think with friends, the difference with friends or people you don't know as well is that um, there's always this barrier of, you know, having to say nice things um, and tr trying to not say what you really mean um, because you feel like it's either too blunt or um, it's mean or whatnot. But, you know, with your siblings, you just, you've learned, you've grown up with them and you just say whatever the hell you want. Um, and they rarely take offense because they just get it. Um, they get who you are. Um, so I think that's the, the main difference and it allows you to drive decisions much faster. Um, but also there are many people with best friends and great friends who are the exact same way. Um, I think the tricky part is that sometimes you have to make tough business decisions that are impactful and you have different preferences. And so um, in those scenarios, it can get pretty tricky and it could you know, strain a relationship. But I think so long as the communication is always blunt and honest, and you just, just commit to that, then it, it works out. Yes. And then we can go. So uh, Homejoy is expanding into a lot of different areas right now from what I've read. Um, can you talk about how you're penetrating these new markets mm -hmm. and sort of what your strategy is for bringing on new clients, getting new employees, that sort of thing? Sure. Um, so we go into markets where we see demand. Or so the way um, the HomeJoy site works is that um, we, don't, we don't necessarily tell you that we're there or not. We just ask you to put in your zip code and then we can track different um, for all the areas when it basically there's a demand map that we have and it lights up essentially um, when it says okay you need to find like a dozen cleaning professionals to go there so when we go there our strategy is one we usually have a beta list at this point um, and and then we just do those and then this is a services based business and so word of mouth matters a lot and so we rely a lot on, on that I think maybe the more interesting thing is when no one knew who the hell home joy was how we got the first few customers um, so the very first few customers, like I said, it was just hustle and getting people and just making people book. Um, but as we launched into markets, what we did was, at that point, we had raised a little bit of capital, and so we were able to buy customers. And so we did things, um, like we would go on Groupon and have deals on Groupon um, and um, go on Facebook, have Facebook ads and stuff like that. And we would usually buy the first 50 or 100 customers. And then what we would see is that you know, especially in dense areas like New York City or, you know, especially in San Francisco, well, San Francisco we did differently, but just say New York City um, where there's, it's very dense. You buy the first 100 customers the first week and then it becomes 300 almost immediately the second week and you don't have to buy as many um, because you're relying a lot on that um, word of mouth that's happening. Um, if you are in a business where word of mouth matters, 
then you should go into areas where you can find customers who are close to each other uh, because density allows it to travel much faster. Whereas what we saw is when we went to a suburb, like in Dallas, Texas, we would do the exact same strategy, but instead of only taking one week like it did in New York City, it would take three months to get to that inflection point where it would just start taking off and the word of mouth actually traveled because everyone's everywhere. Um, and, and so that was our strategy there. For, th for the cleaning professional side, we um, just use Craigslist ads. Look, anywhere where people are looking for this kind of work, we just go there and put ourselves in front of them um, and convince them that this was a great um, opportunity for them. Um, how long did it take for you and your partner uh, to see actual profits from your company? And not just to uh, pay your bills, but you know, to have more of a comfortable life, like such as you know, going on trips and stuff. Hmm. Good question. So, profits. Um, so I look at profits actually in two different ways. One is when you do a cleaning, is that job profitable? Like after you know, the the customer gives you money, then you pay the cleaning professional, and then there are other co there's customer service costs and all these things. And then there's another level of profitability, which is operating profitability for the company, which is all the revenue in the door after you pay all the cleaning professionals, after you service everything, after you pay all the um, the employees, engineers, and stuff like that, and that's profitable. Um, and so I would say it's very important. And, and we and for on the job, it's what we call unit economics. So for each unit, for each job, um, you have to, you know there's a there's a revenue and there's an expense line. Um, how long did it take us to get there? So this kind of business that we do, um, uh, the variable costs reduce um, with scale. So what I mean by that is um, we had to hire three customer service agents to service, um, let's say, call it, I don't know, this is a random number, but 100, 100 customers. Um, but uh, at 200 customers, we only needed three. At 400 customers, we only needed three. You know, um, so you get my point. The, the variable cost of a customer service decreases over time. Um, and so there's a certain point of scale where um, the job becomes pretty profitable. Um, so how long did it take us to get there? Um, I think it actually took us, um, for each market, it took us about five to six months to get there. Um, and so that meant we did have to raise money to launch new markets because um, we were just unprofitable things sometimes. Now, in terms of uh, in terms of company profit, like the company being profitable itself after paying employees and insurance and whatnot, um, so I think there's two philosophies there. There is um, you can make profit and just you know keep making profit and every and distribute it amongst everybody, or you can make profit and um, redistribute that money into growing the company, like buying more customers and stuff like that. And for startups, I think. For me, startups is about growth. It's about, you know, forgo foregoing stability, foregoing those profits um, for now to um, to grow the company. And so that's our philosophy. So right now we are not profitable because anything we make, we just invest right back into the business um, so that we can um, get to uh, um, we can we can win essentially at the end of the day. Um, for me, Homejoy is about building a household, you know brand name. It's about building be it being the most trusted brand in the home. And so I need to be at a millions of customers of scale um, before um, be before um, anything else. And so I'm going to do whatever it takes to do that. That being said, you don't want to be so unprofitable that, you know, you have to keep raising a shit ton of money. That's not good either. Um, so there's a there's a fine balance there. Um, but So could you describe your personal leadership style in, in a few words and then uh, maybe share how it has helped you be successful with Homejoy? Sure. Um, personal leadership style. So I am a, um, what's a good way to put it? I'm a very hands-off person. And so I, I tend to hire people who work directly with me who can just do their own stuff. And, and they come to me with homework, essentially. Um, they say, for me to hit my goal, I need three things from you, and then I go do these three things. And so I have a task list of things to do. Um, so that's one in terms of running the business and getting, you know, 
folks, um, getting folks to juice up and, and make progress. Um, I think the style I have taken, though, in terms of setting the vision for the company, kind of culture and things like that, is we come from, like, our first value is, core value is nobody is above any job. Um, and so I come from a very humble place. And I think that reflects the fact that, um, you know, we are most passionate about the service professionals, about the, prof uh, the, the cleaning professionals and what they go through and the hard work that they have to do, and that they're actually the ones supporting the platform. Um, and so it must be that even if, you know, you're an engineer that makes, you know, a lot more money, um, you should understand, you know, what you're building, the product you're building and who you're building it for um, and never feel like you're better than them. Um, and so that's the culture we have at Homejoy is sort of, you know, a reflection of who I am, um, which is, you know, never um, just like staying humble essentially um, th through everything. So I'm not the type of you know, you know, stand on a stand on a, unless I'm drunk. But I'm not the type of person that like stands on a desk and like yells and says you know, here are all the great things that we're gonna do. I'm very methodical and very logical, um, and so you know you can pretty much follow my thoughts for the most part. Any other questions? Oh, one here. What would you say is the main thing that has contributed to your success? The main thing that's contribu contributed to my success? Um, I think, that's a great question. Um, so I think working with my brother has helped a lot um, because he always has my back and I always have his back. Um, and we can speak very fluidly with each other, um, which makes things, like I said before, makes decisions go much faster. Um, and you always need to, like, the, the thing that stops most startups is indecisiveness. It's like, tr or trying to do too many things at once and getting stretched too thin. Um, so those things were solved because of who I work with. Um, but I think ultimately for anybody, like, success is perseverance. It's just, you know, I'm going to tell you now, like, if you're going to do a startup, it's going to take so many years, and it's going to take a lot of hard work and, like, very little sleep to get where you want to get. Um, and it might not work out, which really sucks. But if you have the perseverance to just keep on going and keep chugging along, like there's a, the probability of something good happening increases along the way. Um, very slowly, unfortunately, but it does increase. Um, and so I, I think if you're going to do it, you just got to, you got to commit to it, basically. And I think um, that's important. So. How many people are going to do startup? Like, does anyone, does anyone have a startup right now? that they're doing? Oh, okay, cool. Okay, um, we have a question from Pool Everywhere. Sure. Uh, recently, there's been a lot of media coverage concerning gender discrimination in the tech workplace. As an Asian American and a female, do you have any sort of response to this? Ooh, tough one. Um, so, I think gender discrimination. Um, so, I think it does exist in the world of tech, um, and I think it's it's a it's a difficult. I haven't honestly fully wrapped my head around the whole debate, um, but um, I think there's two things. One is in the tech world, you know, there's a premium for being an engineer, um, and you know, th there's just a lack of female women in um, in engineering, um, and so this it breeds a whole, you know. People, like-minded people come together and they work well together, that's fine and all good, but if you have someone that's kind of different coming in, um, how do you react to that? And that reaction is very important. So I've been fortunate enough to be in community, to be um, parts of startups that are very female friendly and where I don't feel like an outcast. Um, and so I personally haven't had any issue, but I definitely do not discount um, issues other people have. I know that exists. I think the problem is really, it comes down to people not realizing um, their actions, and I think it comes down to subtle biases um, where people don't actually realize um, that they have a bias. Like, they say, they say they're fine, but they're not really fine, um, and people have to come to, um, people have to come to realization that that's happening. Um, but anyway, my, my take on it right now is that I know it's a problem, um, 
and um, it's something that I'm actually um, uh, doing more research on myself to see how I can help with that. I have a question too. Um, you have uh, clients or customers in other parts of the world, right? Have you noticed anything special? I mean, I, I think about you know home services in England or Germany or wherever, and my impression is that they're a little different. And so I'm just curious if you have encountered issues having to do with the internationalization of your of your concept. Yes, that's a good question. So there are definitely there are definitely culture differences um, between you know we're in Germany and London. Um, so London is actually quite similar to New York City. So there's not much difference there other than they say words differently than us. Um, in Germany, there are some little cultural differences in how the expectation the expectations of customers, um, and also um, well, it's mostly expectations uh, expectation setting um, and. But every everywhere, people's idea of clean is different, um, even in the U.S. And so, what I have noticed is actually people um, in the South, uh, in the Southeast, are friendlier than folks elsewhere, and so they give better reviews. Um, but that doesn't mean that necessarily we're doing. And we have one more, one last question. We've been asking um, all week for our speakers. Could you share what you believe the next big thing or the next big wave in your industry is? Oh, in okay, good question. Next big thing. I believe so. Ho home and so I'll speak to the home services industry because that's what I know best. Um, so I think HomeJoy in its carnation today is it's essentially you know. Um, you know, you pick up your mobile phone, you can press a button, and someone comes to your place. I think the next carnation of it is you're living in your home. You don't even need to really push a button because um, be because through actions that you've taken, through booking a cleaner or whatever, um, or through you know getting grocery deliveries or whatnot, um, there's enough data out there. Um, you know, private data, of course, where things can be predicted of what you want. And so it's things like, you know, just coming home from work and the groceries are, you know, that the 10 grapes you always want in the refrigerator is there. Um, to knowing that your, your refrigerator is about to probably expire. It's about, you know, it needs to check up and um, for someone to contact you and um, tell you, you know, let's get that checkup to her. Um, and so it's about living in a home that's smart, um, but also living in a home where um, uh, you don't have to worry about it and you can just live, you know, carefree, stress-free all the time. So. Thank you, Adora. Thank you very much. Let's have a round of applause for Adora. Our next speaker will be Trip Adler in about 15 minutes at 1.15. In the meantime, um, feel free. There's snacks on the side and in the back. Grab a beverage, grab a snack. And if you don't have your IST 